Good morning. It's good to uh, be back with you here on Facebook Live as we are continuing our study of the Beatitudes found in Matthew chapter 5 verses 3 through 12. And today we will look at verses 10 through, uh, through 12, those last few verses and that, uh, as we close out this series of lessons. It's been so good to be with you uh, during these. Uh, we will continue to meet here on Facebook Live. Uh, we'll meet again Wednesday night at 7. I hope you'll be able to join us for that. And if you can't view it live, uh, they will be saved and posted on Facebook for you to watch later. As we begin our study this morning, I would like to begin with a prayer. If you would, let's bow. Father God, Almighty and glorious King, we are indeed so grateful and humbled at, um, at your love, at your generosity in our lives, at seeing the work of your hands. Father, we are so thankful that you have given to us your word, that you have um, given us direction and guidance in our lives through the study of the Bible. Father, we pray that as we continue our study of Matthew 5 today, that you'll bless our time, that you'll be with us as we examine uh, these words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, today is a day when we honor the mothers in our lives. We are so thankful for all they do for us, uh, for all the ways they bless our lives, for all the ways they help us and Father, we are just uh, so thankful for them and, and for what they do. And we just ask for you to bless them and, and bless their hands, Father, and, and their hearts. And we pray that uh, we will properly honor them today and, and our families um, in our lives. Father, we're so thankful for the gift of grace and mercy that comes through Jesus, your Son, and our Savior. Thank you, Father. Please, Father, continue to forgive us as we fall short. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, before we jump into our study, I want to begin by saying Happy Mother's Day to all the uh, women out there, all those moms who work so hard and diligently in their families uh, with with their children and with their grandchildren. Uh who show an example uh, of the love of God in their lives, who are so hardworking and devoted to, to those who have been uh, bestowed into their care. We are thankful for you and we love you. As I mentioned earlier, today we are looking at verses 10 through 12 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Interesting uh, way for Jesus to end our study. As we've looked over the past few weeks, we've, we've seen him lay out what is the character of a disciple of God. In, verses, uh, three, um, in verse 3, he talked about the need to be humble, to be humbled uh, in our lives. Uh, in verse number 4, he talks about the need for us to um, to mourn or or to be convicted of the sin in our lives, and how that conviction ought to um, ought to create within us a desire to be meek or 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 to be self controlled, to put away those evil desires, uh, those evil lusts that sometimes we pursue. In verse number six, he talks about how that ought to then move us into a desire to uh, to be righteous, to follow the will of God, to do right things in our lives, to put aside the 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 evil words we say, to put aside the evil works that we've committed, and pursue good things, to pursue good words, to pr pursue uh, living as Jesus Christ himself lived. And then knowing ourselves, being humbled by our sin and by the word of God, 
verse number 7, he goes on to say that that ought to play out in our lives as we show mercy and grace to others in our lives. Those who maybe have wronged us in the past, um, we ought to demonstrate that same kind of mercy that we found in God to others. In verse number 8, um, as we are growing as a follower, as a Christian, we are purifying our hearts. Again, that emphasis on expunging the evil in our lives and seeking out purity, um, filling ourselves up. Verse number 9, uh, we are, uh, as a follower, as a disciple uh, of God, we are seeking peace uh, with other people. We're not seeking dispute. Uh, we're not seeking to uh, to cause harm to others, but we seek out peace um, in our lives. And then we get to verse number 10 uh, through 11. He says, Blessed are... Uh, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's an interesting way for him to close out um, uh, this section uh, as he talks about the blessings of being persecuted. Now, uh, it, it's kind of like a car salesman. If you imagine... Uh, I'm sure many of us, if not all, have had the experience of going to a car dealership. That's always a fascinating time as, uh, uh, as the salesman. Uh, it's been my experience anyway. Maybe you've had a different one. But the salesman rushes out to you. Uh, they don't want to... Uh, they're not just going to leave you out there, but they're going to come out and, and they're going to try to sell you a car, right? Can you imagine going to a dealership? Um, you visit the dealer and the salesman who is showing you uh, the latest model takes you on a test drive. That's pretty ordinary. Um, as you turn out of the parking lot, he launches into his sales pitch. Okay, all that's pretty general, pretty, um, pretty much the way it goes uh, most of the time. But let's put a little skew on it. Let's imagine instead of the normal sales pitch, he, uh, he says three hours in this car and your back will be so out of joint, you will need physical therapy to walk upright again. The cost of repairs alone will put my children through college. And when you drive it down the street, every head will turn because everyone who sees you will be laughing at you. Now, how many of us are going to rush to buy that car? It's not a very good sales pitch, is it? Uh, it's not very appealing. And when you look at Matthew chapter, and we'll come back to that in just a minute, but when you come to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, uh, for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This idea of, uh, of persecution is not a pleasant one. We wouldn't call that a sales pitch, would we? It's not a very good one anyway. But see, Jesus isn't trying to give us a sales pitch here. He's trying to give us some honesty and truth about what it's going to create in our lives. Um, he's offering us a word of comfort to disciples who will be persecuted for their faith and because they are his disciples. He knows that no one, at least no normal person, likes being persecuted. And yet he's being honest with us. It's more like going to the doctor and having to deal with some very difficult physical issues. Well, the doctor isn't going to be like the salesman, is he? He's not going to, um, to gloss over or try to sell us, pitch us why this is a good thing. They're going to tell us the honest truth that it, um, if it's a difficult situation, if there's going to be uh, some difficult days ahead, they're going to tell us that. They're going to give us 
the truth as much as they can at least interpret it or see it coming. And so when Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted, he's not meaning um, to try to sell us on being Christian. He's trying to be honest with us. Um, it's interesting, in 2015, Lifeway did a research study, and they found that 63% of responders agreed or strongly agreed that Christians are facing growing levels of persecution. That was up from 50% in 2013. Being a child of God comes with some disruption in our, in our life, with, with with possible persecution in our lives at times. Now, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus again isn't trying to sugarcoat this or gloss over it, but he's being honest with us about what's going to happen as a result of obedience to the gospel. In Matthew chapter 10, he, uh, he spoke these words, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come uh, to do what? I'm sorry. Getting ahead of myself here. Uh, for I have come to set man against his father and daughter against her mother um, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And in verse number 36, he goes on to say, And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Now when you read that, it's a very kind of shocking text. But again, Jesus is just being honest with us. That there are times when, when a decision to obey the gospel may create some real um, uh, shockwaves in our families because they're not going to be supportive of it. Uh, they're not going to be uh, super accepting of it. Now, when Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace on earth, now, we remember just a couple verses earlier, he said, blessed are the peacemakers. What he's saying here is he didn't come with the intention of causing, um, of just angering one person against another, of creating dissension. But when the truth is taught, when the truth is obeyed, those who are of the world are not going to like it. We notice what John tells us in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Again, that's a pretty shocking text. Uh, you know, to use the word hate, uh, hate's a very strong term. Why would the world hate us? As a Christian, I'm just trying to do what's right. I'm just trying to live a good life. I'm trying to follow God's commands. I'm trying to be a good example. Why would the world hate me? Well, it goes back to what the truth is and what Jesus is teaching is not something that the world wants to accept because it means that if the world accepts it, then there are changes that have to be made. Now, you may have experienced this in your life at different times, but uh, maybe growing up, your parents told you uh, what the right thing was to do, but because you didn't want to do the right thing, you may have uh, rebelled against it. Even as an adult, there may be uh, times in your life when you find yourself uh, knowing what the truth is, knowing that people are trying to help you, but at the same time, because you don't want to change, because your desire to do the other thing is so strong, you just, instead of accepting the truth, and you just push it aside. You rebel against it. You rebuke against it. Because it goes against what you know, or, or I'm sorry, it goes against what you want to do. And so the world, uh, our world, is filled with sin. And it doesn't want to give that sin up. It, it's filled with lies and, and untruths. And it doesn't want to give those things up. And so being a child of God, in accepting the truth, and accepting God's word, 
it may cause disruption in our life, and it most likely will because there are changes that we need to make, and there may not be changes that the world likes for us to make. On top of all that, we have someone out there that uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 8, uh, I believe it's verse 8 through 10 there, 1 Peter 5, you know, Peter says the devil is walking about, is roaming about like a lion seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't want us to do the right thing, and so he's going to try everything in his power to stop us from doing what's right. And so he'll use um, things like uh, trouble in our lives, like um, uh, persecution, to harm our faith, to try to pull us away from God. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. As a child of God, uh, I am trying to, uh, to live a life that is opposed to what the world teaches, and the world doesn't like it. And so when we get back to Matthew chapter 5, blessed are those who are persecuted. I want to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, this, this idea that Jesus is presenting here about Blessed are the persecuted. Why are they blessed? What is it that um, that is a blessing about being persecuted? That seems counterintuitive. Well, let's look at a little bit here about why the overcomers are blessed, those who overcome the persecution to remain faithful. Number one, they're blessed because they have turned away from sin. Uh, there in that very first verse, blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake. Um, <clears throat> I want to look at a passage in 1 Peter chapter 4 for just a minute and, and hopefully explore this idea about why there's a blessing in this in regard to turning away from sin. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, Peter writes, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Uh, it's like going into battle. Uh, a soldier who's going into battle needs to be armed with the proper weapons to, to face the enemy. Well, Peter says, uh, look at the, the battle that Christ uh, faced. It's the same battle you're going to face, so arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Now, in our battle, we don't take weapons in the, in the way that we most often think of, you know, a weapon of war. But our weapon is a different way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. As a child of God, I've tried to put away sin in my life. I'm... I'm I'm attempting to live a life of repentance, uh, of making changes in my life, getting rid of the, the bad, corrupt things that I did, and now I'm trying to take on those good things in my life. I'm trying to live differently. Um, and it means a change of thinking. Um, verse 2, So as to live for the rest of the time, in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. There's, there's the, the crux of the issue that we face as Christians. When I became a Christian, when I obeyed the gospel, when I was immersed into Christ for the remission of my sins, Galatians 3.27 tells me I was clothed in Christ. Now, when that happened, God didn't take me out of the world. He didn't change me from a, a fleshly, um, from, from a spirit living in the flesh to a spirit out of the flesh. I still um, live in the same body. I still live in the same world that I lived in before. But my way of thinking has changed. I'm no longer asking what makes me happy. Now I'm asking what will make God happy? What is it that God wants from me? And I'm trying to live 
to that end, as all Christians are. And, and, and so, so God hasn't removed us from the world and set us somewhere differently. We're still having to live in the same world, but with a different mindset. To no longer live for the passions of the flesh, those things that I desired before, those temptations are still there. But now as a Christian, I'm trying to overcome the temptations in my life to do evil, to live to the passions of the flesh, and now I'm trying to live to the passions of God. I'm trying to uh, follow His example. He goes on in verse 3, For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living, now when he talks about living, uh, doing what the Gentiles want to do, he's, he's talking about the, the evil world. Right? Now there's some Gentiles who've become Christians. He's obviously not talking about them, but he's talking about Gentiles in the, representing the world and, and its evil passions. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry, all those evil things they were involving themselves in. As a child of God, I have put those things away. Now, there are some Christians who, who used to live like that, who used to uh, go to drunken parties, who, who used to do uh, you know, evil, sinful things in their lives. And some, sometimes uh, they can be what we characterize as big sins. You know, no sin is big or little, all sin is sin. But that's the way we view it. And some people have, have had to overcome some pretty big things in their lives. They've had to put some uh, pretty big temptations aside to do evil. Well, that's the commitment we make as a Christian. And, and there were some Christians in the first century who, who knew this all too well. And so Peter says, we have to remove those things from our lives. We have to not give in to those. Uh, we have to put the past behind us. Now notice verse number four. Now this is the result of us making changes in our lives. With respect to this, they, the world, are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. Now, I know there's some people who are watching right now who know this all too well. And there are a lot of examples that, that we can think about of maybe in our own lives or our friends who have obeyed the gospel. And because of that, they've had to make some big changes. Maybe they were um, really big into... Um, drinking alcohol and becoming drunk and and now they've had to stop doing that because drunkenness is a sin and, and so they put that aside. Well, the people they used to drink with now look at them and, and they may say things like, well, you think you're better than me now? Um, and maybe a lot worse. But the world is not going to understand why you make those changes in your life. The world is not going to understand why you don't participate in those sinful activities. And that can cause some pain for us. And at times, as a Christian, because I've had to make changes in my life, because my friends refuse to quit the sin in their life, I may, may have lost friends. Friends that I can't be around because the temptation to sin is too great. And, and I've had to put that aside. And that can cause real pain. Now, the prayer is, is that eventually those friends will see our example and they'll make changes in their life as well. But don't expect them to understand what you're doing because until they make the same decision you have to change their lives, to quit the sin in their lives, to obey the gospel, they're not going to understand. And 
But what does that mean for us? Let's go to John chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. And notice what Jesus says. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and, the pe and people love the darkness rather than the light, because the light, um, I'm sorry, uh, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Again, why, do, why does the world react the way it does toward us as Christians? You know, we're just trying to be uh, God-fearing, honest, upright people. We're not trying to hurt them, or we're not trying to, uh, uh, to cause them any kind of harm. Why, why do they hate us? It's because of the, their own guilt and conviction for their own sin. We're not coming and knocking on the doors and demanding they make changes in their lives. That's up to them. That's between them and God. But because of the conviction of their own sin, they hate those who are trying to do right. And I'm not saying this is true with all people in the world, but, uh, but it definitely can happen. And so, understand that if the world reacts to you that way, that's the same way they reacted to our Lord. Because you turned away from your sin, they may hate you. They may persecute what you're doing. And there's some words of wisdom for us to think about. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 26, notice what Jesus says to his disciples. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. I think the point here that we really need to think about, it's not that we should want people to dislike us. I'm not saying you should be seeking for people to hate you or to despise the way you live your life. At the same time, we shouldn't be seeking their approval. We need to seek to do what's right in the eyes of God. They may be fine with us being a Christian. When I became a Christian, my parents um, weren't Christians. They hadn't obeyed the gospel. Yet, they didn't give me a difficult time about it. Uh, they 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 let me um, practice uh, my faith. They they let me attend church. They didn't give me a hard time about that. I know it's not the case with all people though. But I didn't seek out their disapproval, right? Uh, nor should we, any of us. However, we also shouldn't seek after their approval because what the world wants is not what God wants. We need to just desire to do what God wants us to do in our lives. Why are the overcomers blessed? Second thing here is because they follow Christ. Now, I've kind of alluded to this a few times, but again, notice verse number 11 of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5 and verse 11. Blessed are you when others... I revile you, I revile you, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Ultimately, why do people hate Christians, or, or why do they despise the way we live as Christians? That has less to do with us than it does with Jesus Himself. In John chapter 15, beginning at verse number 18, Jesus said, and, and, and again, he's just being forthright with his disciples here and being honest with them. He says, verse number 18, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore the world hates you. 
The world hates you because it hates me. Why does the world hate Christians? Why does, why does it sometimes despise Christianity? Because it, it really goes back to Jesus himself and, and the gospel that he brought to this world. In uh, Paul's second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul says this to the young preacher, you know, a young man who, who, who is just trying to preach the gospel, trying to, uh, to reach out to those who are lost with the saving grace of God. Paul says to him in verse number 12, Indeed, all who desire to live godly or to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, you notice Paul's very definitive there. He's not leaving any wiggle room. He says you will be persecuted for all the reasons that we've already mentioned. And then, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 29, Paul writes again to the Philippian brethren, For it has been granted to you uh, that for the sake of Christ, for the sake of Christ, you should not um, only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And so we often talk about following the example of Jesus. One of the examples he gave us is the willingness to suffer hardship, to suffer persecution, just as he did, and to do it humbly and with the same attitude and mindset that he did. And then finally, when we look at why are we blessed because we suffer persecution, it is because we look for something beyond this life because we look for an eternal reward. Um, a couple years ago, I, I came across this uh, illustration. Uh, one of the most grueling uh, bicycle races in, in the world is, of course, the Tour de, uh, Tour de France. Um, it's held each year. Uh, a large number of uh, bicyclists um, you know, are... Um, uh, con contestants in this race. One of the contestants uh, described it in National Geogra uh, Geog <laughs> Geography um, Geographic um, uh, in an article entitled An Annual Madness. He uh, described it this way. The race covers about 2,000 miles includes some of France's most difficult and mountainous terrain. Eating and drinking is done on the run, and there are extremes of heat and cold. To train for the event, you have to ride your bicycle 22,000 miles a year. Now just think about that for a minute. I mean, you've got... Um, you got it to where you you got to travel two thousand miles. It's a long way, right? Uh, you you've got to be able to deal with um, mountainous terrain, the, these um, these huge inclines. You got to be able to to have the mu muscle density and strength to to endure that to overcome it. You got to be able to uh, eat while riding and drink. You've got to uh, uh, be able to experience these uh, tremendous changes in weather from heat to cold. And to train for that event, you've got to ride your, your bicycle 22,000 miles a year. Now you would think for all that training, for all that hardship you have to suffer, man... That must carry with it a, a prize of immense value. $100,000? $10,000? What do you get for winning the Tour de France? And some of you may be already saying what this is, thinking it in your mind, but the winner of the race for traveling 2,000 miles through all of that receives a jersey. 
a jersey. No money, not not some big elaborate trophy, a jersey. What in the world would motivate someone to do that? LaSalle, the, the man doing the interview with National Geographic, summed it up this way. Why? To sweep through the arc of uh, the trophy on the last day and to be able to say you finished the Tour de France. Finishing the race is the reward. When you think about Christianity and you think about what it is to be a Christian, why is it you're a Christian? Why have you obeyed the gospel if you have? What is it that you're looking forward to? Is it something that that it can provide to us in this life? Or is it something else? Notice again in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 12. Jesus goes on to say, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Why is it that we endure this persecution? Why was it that those Christians who lived in the 2nd and 3rd century who, who endured such heavy brutal persecution. Why did they endure that? Why did they go through those things? What was it that that, that made it able, made them able, strong enough to, to face down the possibility of being thrown into prison, to being fed to lions, to enduring all kinds of just horrific Things like that. And it's because of what they saw at the end of the journey. The reward. That as a Christian, as a child of God, I understand something about my life. This world is a false reality. Nothing in this world, nothing this world can provide us will last through eternity. None of it will last beyond this life, but once you and I breathe our last, that will end any reward or offering this world can make to us. There's only real, only one real reality, and that is what happens after this life. In Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 15, Paul writes to the Roman church, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We're not looking to something this world can offer us. But as a child of God, I've been adopted into the family of God. And I am looking forward to the day I can be with God in heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes very poignantly to our discussion today. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, and that's what we see in life, isn't it? The older we get, the more we realize our, our world, our ourselves, our bodies, these bodies are not going to last forever. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. What is it that you're looking forward to in your life? What is it that brings you reward or satisfaction? If it's something only this world can offer, really, how long would that last? As a child of God, as someone who has obeyed the gospel, all the joys I receive in this life, I understand and realize that every one of those joys that the world offers is temporary. But what God can offer to us, what God does offer to us, is not some temporary thing, but it is something that is eternal. As we bring this to a conclusion today I close with this question have you overcome sin in your life to experience the joy of the hope that awaits those who are faithful have you overcome sin in your life or has it overcome you as a Christian if you've allowed sin to overcome in your life, you know there's some repenting that needs to be done, some changes that need to take place. If you've never obeyed the gospel, if you've never experienced the joy of knowing that I'm saved and that I have a home in heaven, I'd love to study with you more about what God's Word teaches us about receiving that reward about obeying the gospel. If I can help in any way, I'm, I'm here and ready to help. The church is ready to help in any way that it can. It's good to be with you. I look forward to being back with you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. We love you and we're praying for you and hope you'll pray for us. We look forward to being back together in fellowship one-on-one -on -one personal fellowship very soon. God bless you.